Well, good evening, everybody. It is great to be here again. Feels like it's been forever because uh, I was sick the last two Sundays and last Wednesday, so I'm very glad to be back. Let's go ahead and start this evening uh, with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this opportunity that you have given to us to be together here tonight, and I pray that you would uh, be with my words as I bring the message that I believe you have laid on my heart, and I pray that you would uh, work through your word and uh, convict us where it is necessary and encourage us uh, to continue on working for you. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You may be seated. Uh, let's go ahead and start uh, turning in our Bibles to Ephesians chapter 5, but it'll be just a minute before we get there. Um, the title of our sermon tonight is Keeping Time. What is timekeeping? I mean, if, if I mention timekeeping to you, what, what is the first thing that comes to your mind? You might think of like a little chronograph, you know, you, you hit the button to time somebody as they're running a race, you hit it again at the end, it stops, you see how long they ran, uh, you can reset it, do it again. Um, keeping time is a major, uh, has been a major part of the human experience going back for thousands of years. Uh, actually, just about since the beginning of recorded history. I did a little bit of research into some of the timekeeping methods going throughout history, and I found it quite interesting. Uh, people started, maybe you've heard of this, called a water clock. The idea was you put a bunch of water in the top, you have a bowl down, down below, and you control how much water comes out. And as the time goes on and the bucket un underneath fills up, you can tell how many hours of the day have passed, roughly how much time has passed. You can imagine that wouldn't be very precise as you're looking at the way the little ripples in the water as it comes down into the bucket, or uh, maybe it's not quite right there on the line. Uh, maybe it's exact, you don't know. It's not gonna be as precise. So telling time moved on later to sundials. You can still see sundials some places today. That actually used the location of the sun to plot the movement of time during the day. But those were also not super precise. And uh, so a more precise thing was needed and we came up with sand uh, hourglasses. That was a very precise way of telling the exact processing of the same amount of time, but it didn't really have any way of tying it to the time of day. Uh, then as you go further in history, you start getting into the mechanical telling of time using energy coiled up in a spring or potential energy from a weight to gradually move a wheel that moves another wheel that moves another wheel that releases just a tiny bit of energy a few times a second to mark the progression of time throughout the day. So those mechanical time pieces like clocks, the big clocks that you see in bell towers, uh, pocket watches as the time went on and things got smaller or even wrist watches. Uh, those mechanical movements uh, kept time measured one hour with between 18,000 and 28,800 beats per hour. So there's this little piece inside that goes like this. It was going about 18,000, 28,000 times per hour to, uh, to allow for the, your hour hand to go around the circle one time. But again, that's not the most precise means of telling time. Uh, it kept on getting more precise as technology improved and now we have quartz watches. Quartz watches are incredibly precise. They have one second defined as 32,768 vibrations of a crystal quartz, a crystal of quartz. Uh, how it counts that, I'm not really sure, but one second, it vibrates 32,000 some odd times. But that's not even precise enough because they've now come up with atomic timekeeping, which defines one second as the amount of time that elapses during 9,192,631,770 cycles 
of the radiation produced by the transition between two levels of cesium-133 atoms. All that to say, it is incredibly precisely defined in our modern scientific world. And people throughout all of history have been obsessed with this concept of keeping time. Second by second, as time has gone on through history, people have wanted to be more and more aware of which precise second they are living in. So the international standardization of timing and keeping time has actually made for some rather interesting and possibly bizarre phenomena. For example, we just came back from this trip to Thailand. Um, normally, you know, if you go far enough east in the U.S., just maybe a couple hours to the east of us here, you get an hour ahead, right? So if I went out to the East Coast, uh, it would, it's now uh, 7, 12. If I went an hour out there, it'd be 8, 12. Same day, 8, 12. So if I go to the West Coast, it would be two hours earlier. It'd be 5, 12. Wednesday, 5, 12 p.m. And that seems like a really great thing because it reflects the time in the sky until you keep on going backwards and backwards and backwards and suddenly it's tomorrow. Uh, the international date line can really make for some confusing travel. So when we took this trip, we left uh, about noon here. We traveled uh, a few hours to Los Angeles, then we got on an airplane Sunday night, and we flew for about 13 hours and landed in South Korea on Wednesday morning. So Sunday night to uh, Tuesday morning, sorry. Sunday night to Tuesday morning, just in a few hours. Uh, it has also caused some confusion with the time change. As people have standardized time, we now have this thing where twice a year we decide we need to move the time of day relative to the sun. If you're wondering where that started, it goes back a long time with the idea being proposed uh, by Benjamin Franklin and, and others, but it was finally made a law during both the First and Second World War as a way to save energy. Uh, they had more time during the day if there was more sunlight. Less, uh, less nighttime when people were working meant they used less energy. So my interest in keeping time has kind of grown over the last few years. I somehow found a video about the mechanical watches during COVID, I believe, and I started watching and learning how those pieces, time pieces, work. And it's an incredibly fascinating world to me that some engineers have been able to take a coiled spring and to gradually build things like chronographs, which time like a stopwatch. Uh, they build calendars, so it marks the passing of a day, the passing of a month. Then they have also built in the moon phase, so it keeps track of where the moon is in the sky relative to the time in the month. And even today, they've come up with a way to uh, release that energy so precisely that they can set a watch now and it will be accurate, including leap years, uh, all the way up until the year 2100. I'm not sure how they have mechanically done that, but it is in the, wa the mechanical watch movement, all that inaccuracy of two seconds a day, which isn't as precise as a quartz movement by any means, but it is still remarkable for a human engineering feat. So it is an interesting application of the phrase, time is money, that the international clock and watch industry, this, this industry that has been keeping track of the progression of time throughout thousands of years and gradually becoming bigger and bigger of more and more importance. The inter international clock and watch market was a $53.11 billion industry in 2023. And it is anticipated to grow to $67.87 billion by 2028. Uh, that's according to the business research company. So. All that to say, time is humanity's most 
valuable resource. Unlike a precious metal, it cannot be mined out of the ground. It cannot be reduced, reused, recycled when it has been put into some form of work. Unlike a precious stone, it cannot be manufactured in a lab when it is too expensive to use a genuine stone. Time, once you have spent it, it is gone. It can never be recovered. So tonight, I would like us to look at the question of how Christians use this most valuable resource of time. And that gets us into our verses in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 15 and 16. See then that ye walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. These are some common verses. They're used quite a bit, especially that verse about redeeming the time. But as we study them tonight, I'd like to walk through and hit some of the key words, talk about what they mean, look at them in their context, and then uh, derive some applications from them. So we'll start first just by looking at that word walk. You know, if you think about, <coughs> sorry, I'm still getting over whatever it was that I've had for the past few weeks. So I may do some more of that as we go throughout the sermon. If you think about the word walk, you might think it's just the action of putting one foot in front of another. It's an action of taking a step. And that is, strictly speaking, the definition of walking. But there is something more in mind in this passage. So if we look at just going back to the beginning of chapter 5, the word walk is used three times. We have it the first time in verse 1. Be therefore followers, uh, sorry, verse 2. Be therefore followers of God as dear children and walk in love. Well, it's very hard to take a step, a physical step, and place your foot squarely in the metaphysical concept of love. So we have a hint there that we're looking outside of just something that happens in the physical realm. This is something that's more of a spiritual concept. The word walk again appears in verse 8. For ye were sometimes darkness, but now are ye light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. And then in our verses that we read, walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise. So the, the concept of walking in these verses is not just referring, as I said, to taking a physical step. It is going deeper than that and has the spiritual sense in mind of our lifestyle. So we're discussing how we are supposed to be living in our walk. The next word, circumspectly. Now, this is actually somewhat of a more rare word in the New Testament. Uh, it is translated three primary ways, circumspectly, like this. It's only one time in the New Testament, but it is also translated as diligently or as perfect or perfectly. So an example of perfect, uh, diligent, would be when Herod sent his soldiers to kill Jesus. His command to them was go and search diligently for the young child. And then uh, Luke also undertook writing his gospel for Theophilus since he had a perfect knowledge of the events of Jesus' life. That's in Luke 1.3. So I believe the concept that we see here of circumspectly looks into the idea of bringing something to completion, working diligently or working hard until it has been brought to a point of completion. So we are to live, and I think the best word to describe it here is probably that word diligently, because we'll see a little bit later, there is a goal that we are trying to work towards. And since uh, we are working towards a goal, diligently would be a good way to do that. So we're gonna kind of create a paraphrase as we go for these verses to give their meaning. We are to, as we begin, live diligently. So walk circumspectly. And we live diligently, continuing on in the next few words, by living wisely. The words are not as fools, but as wise. So these words are actually uh, 
contrasted with each other by being the same word. Uh, fools and wise are basically the same word in the original language. They're sophos, uh, which has come into the English language in the word like sophomore, the second year in high school, wise fool is what that means literally. Sopho at the beginning would be the word for wisdom. Uh, you also have uh, sophisticated, which gives an, a concept of uh, being wise about the world and uh, things like that. So sophos is the word for wisdom. That is how we are supposed to live as wise men, literally. The word for fools is contrasted by using sophos again, but having the, adding the prefix ah to it, in front of it. So we use this same idea in English quite a bit. We have the word moral and amoral. You have the word social and asocial, or asocial. Some, so the one gives a concept, and then by adding an ah in front of it, you completely oppose it. So not as being without wisdom completely, like completely and totally separated from wisdom. That is not how you should be living diligently, but rather you should be living as a wise man. And how, what is the wisdom in which we are supposed to live? What are we working to bring to completion? That goes back to the word circumspectly. Well, that is, as we look here, redeeming the time. Redeeming the time. It's a financial term financial reckoning term, buy up the time, literally, which is actually a very interesting concept because, as I said earlier, once your time is gone, you cannot recover it. But here the command is to buy it up, like you buy it in the marketplace and you store it like something precious. Let's, let's hold that thought. Let's, keep, let's look into these words a little bit more. Buying is also applied, the buying, meaning redeeming, is also applied to Jesus' act of purchasing us with his blood. Revelation 5 verse 9 says, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by the blood out of every, na every kindred and tongue and people and nation. Redemption is Jesus' act of purchasing us with his blood. When we are saved, we are redeemed. Jesus' blood covers our sins. Jesus' blood bought us off the slave market of sin and has made us heirs with him of the promises of God. The time. So we have the idea that we are to buy something. What? The time. The time is a, is a big concept. Uh, this word is used quite a bit outside of the Bible, so it had quite a bit of cultural baggage to it when Paul used it in this exact context. Uh, the concept of time in this particular Greek word was closely uh, tied to the Stoicism, uh, Stoicism and its concept of ethics. And that would have been a very familiar concept to the ancient people in ancient Greece, to educated people in ancient Greece. To them, it was the decisive moment, the decisive moment with implications, good, bad, whatever those implications might be, the decisive moment with implications. And in the New Testament, it is also used as the decisive moment uh, when people had the opportunity to respond to Jesus' teachings. That's one example. In Luke chapter 12, verse 56, I'm going to go ahead and turn there and read that. Ye hypocrites, ye can discern the face of the sky and of the earth, but how is it that ye do not discern this time? The people that were there listening to Jesus had a decisive moment. The decisive moment was that Jesus was there in front of them and they had an opportunity to receive him and to believe him. But they could not discern that that moment was then because they were blinded. It's also a decisive moment when the Old Testament prophecies were to be fulfilled. If we look at Mark chapter 1, verse 15. 
and saying, The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of, he- of God is at hand. Repent ye and believe the gospel. The fulfillment of prophecy came at a specific time in history when all things were prepared as God had intended for them to be prepared. And then last, it is a decisive moment when our lifestyles have definite implications for our future events. And that is what we are looking at in these verses. So our uh, summary so far, we are to, uh, we are to live diligently not as though we are in the absence of wisdom, but as though we are wise men. Buying up the time. Why? Because the days are evil. The reason for this instruction stands in stark contrast to the, uh, this is the reason for the instruction, and it stands in stark contrast to the command to buy up the time. The majority of this world, if you look around, you would say is not buying up the time. If anything, you would say that people have been coming up with more and more ways to distract from what is truly important, more and more ways to distract from what is truly important in this world. If you think of, uh, if you think of the digital entertainment industry, just lumping everything in that together, There's very little in that that qualifies as eternally valuable. And yet, how much of that absorbs, or how much of our time is absorbed every day into that that large bucket? That is something that uh, is not included, I believe, in the concept of redeeming our time. Although, there are definitely times for relaxation, and I'm not trying to say that. This is that there is no uh, time for that. The concept of the days are evil when people are investing their time not into the proper things, into buying back their time, but just doing the things that they want to do. The majority of this world is allowing these decisive moments, the time to just slide on by. They are not taking advantage of their decisive moments as they succumb to lifestyles of darkness. We're in Ephesians chapter five, and I'd like us to just look at some of these here. We'll read starting in verse one, and we'll come up to verse 15. Be therefore followers of God as dear children, and walk in love, as Christ also hath loved us, and hath given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet smelling savor. But, fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not be once named among you as become a saints. Neither filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor jesting, which are not convenient, but rather giving of thanks. So in verse three, we have sins of the flesh, sexual sins that are characteristic of people who are not redeeming their time. People who are living as fools, not as wise. Verse 4, we have uh, conversation, like things that are coming out of your mouth that are not characteristic of living wisely, but would rather be characteristic of living foolishly, except the end, rather giving of thanks. That would be the profitable use of your tongue. Continuing on, for this you know that no whoremonger or unclean person nor covetous man Uh, who is an idolater, hath any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no man deceive you with vain words, for because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. Be uh, Be not ye, therefore, partakers with them, for ye were sometimes darkness. You were, notice that past tense, addressed to believers. This is what they were in the past. Once they are saved, they are no longer. But now... Are ye in the Lord? Walk as children of light. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth, proving what is acceptable unto the Lord. And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. For it is a shame even to speak of those things which are done of them in secret. 
but all things that are reproved are made manifest by the light. For whatsoever doth make manifest is light. Wherefore he saith, Awake thou that sleepest, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. So looking at these verses, we read in these verses the lifestyle of a foolish man who is not redeeming his time. Contrast it with what you should be, the past and the present. The past allowed time to slip by unheeded, unreclaimed. The present, do you not, do not be as a Christian like your past, allowing those minutes, those precious opportunities to just slide by. So as we get to the paraphrase that we are looking for uh, the, whole, the whole set of verses that we've been looking at, live diligently, not as though you had no wisdom, but wisely, buying up the time because others are failing to, because the days are evil. So let's illustrate this for a minute. Going back to our watch, our clocks illustration. Um, so back in the 1970s and the 1980s, the quartz movement just about destroyed the Swiss watch movement industry, the Swiss watch, uh, the Swiss watch industry. I don't know why that was hard to say, but mechanical movements could not compete in cost and in uh, accuracy with the quartz movement. So for a time, it really struggled, although it has recently been making a comeback. And now, today, brands like Rolex, uh, AP, or Patek Philippe, brands like that have achieved a global recognition as a status symbol for someone who has officially made it in their lives. Uh, it seems like if you can walk into a watch store, buy a watch brand new, pay for it completely without obviously going into debt, then you have made it. And that is the idea behind these watches. That's the, I would almost say that's the culture they've wanted to cultivate, that it is an elite status symbol to have one of these watches. So as a result of that, people who are into watches dream of having one of these watches. So let's, let's draw a uh, contrast between two different people here. Person number one, he sits at home. He watches YouTube videos all day. He finds out all about the different kinds of watches. He researches how they work. He knows just about everything there is to know about a watch. And he dreams about having a high, a high, a high society, expensive timepiece that he can uh, that he can have for his own and eventually pass on to his children. But although he goes to work and he makes enough to provide for his family, he never really invests extra time into saving money for the watch that he desires. He just kind of lets his spare time fly by. He, he uh, never does anything to get extra cash. He's quick to spend money on whatever new TV ad shows up in his newsfeed that person's probably never going to get his dream of having a watch. He has failed to seize his time. Now, contrast that with person number two. Person number two works full time at his regular job. He provides for his family with that regular job and has learned about watches and wants badly to have a Rolex, for example. So he takes an extra part-time job, 20 hours a week extra. He works that for two years, uh, working 20 hours a week extra at about $20 an hour. Figure after tax, he'd make around $35,000 extra. And he's just been putting that away, gradually saving up his money to buy this watch. He does not spend money on things he does not need. He is very careful with his investments and it pays off. He has the money to buy the watch. He may decide to buy that watch. He may have reached that point at which he has made it. But why did he reach the point of making it, whereas the first person failed? Because he actually did something 
profitable with his time. He redeemed his time for a purpose. And now we get to our application. Although our time, once it goes, as you watch the seconds on a clock, once those seconds have passed, although the time can never be reclaimed, we can invest it wisely. And according to these verses, we can buy it back so it has an eternal value. Let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Verses 11 through 15. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall be clear, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide, which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss. But he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. It is a wise investment of time to build on the foundation of Jesus Christ. That means to build the church of God, to work and invest your time in the development of, not talking about the building the church, but the people that are in the church. This is precious in God's sight, and it will amount to eternal reward for those who do. Building foolishly, however, with garbage and worthless actions, worthless substances, will mean that we suffer loss eternally. There's a direct correlation between this passage and our passage in Ephesians. We build with permanent materials by giving our time back to God, investing our time into others. We can read our Bibles, develop ourselves, but we don't develop ourselves just to become super Christian ourselves. We read and study so that we can give back what God has given to us to other people. We pray for others. We talk to our friends and family that need to be saved. We talk to our neighbors. We share the gospel. We confront people that need to be confronted when they are living in lifestyles of sin. That's actually, uh, let's go to Daniel. I actually have this one here. Daniel 12, verse 3. And they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament, and they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. It is always a wise investment of our time to work with people to help them in their path toward righteousness. There are not many things on this world that will survive all of eternity. As a matter of fact, I can think of one, and that is the human soul. The human soul will not be destroyed when the present heaven and earth are destroyed. It will go on into an eternity of one of two places. Either it will go into an eternity in heaven, or it will go into an eternity in hell. And in eternity, there will be a continued progression of time. We will know that time is continuing to go on. Uh, I could take you to verses in Revelation, for example, where the tree of life bears fruit every month, and then there are others that I could show you that indicate there will be time, a conception of time throughout all of eternity. But how, how would it feel to be stuck in a place like hell for all of eternity, where there is no turning back the clock to return and take another choice. And so I challenge you tonight, I don't know, I'm pretty sure most everybody that is here is saved, but if you have not been saved, if you have not believed on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, time keeping, minute by minute, second by second, do not let this next second pass on without making sure of that tonight. The Bible says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. It is a very easy thing to be saved. It is not hard, but you just must believe. And for those who are believing, there is no greater calling than to dedicate your life to working for the harvest. You have time given to you by the master on this earth. 
There will be an accounting for how you use that time. And if you are willing to give your time back to God, to serve him in the harvest field, if he calls you to that, to serve him in any way, there is a reward for that service. So in conclusion, I leave you with a question. Living wisely is not the norm in today's world, but it should be the default for believers. Will you buy back your time every day? Will you buy back your time? Let's go ahead and pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this, this time that you have given to us on earth. We thank you that you have given us an opportunity to work for you and to redeem our time for rewards in eternity. I pray that we would use our time every day wisely. And it's in Jesus' name I pray.